Welcome back CIS 1400 and welcome to module 2. Uh, in module 2 we are going to be talking about input processing and output or other words known as IPOs. Um, again this is a supplemental demonstration to the reading so if you have not yet read chapter 2 please go back and do so. Uh, where you're going to discuss output, input, and variables, um, the design of a program, how to make variable assignments and calculations, the data types that you'll use in their declarations, uh, about constants, how to hand trace a program, document a program, and design your first program. All of those things we're going to talk about here, but again, it's meant to be a supplement to the reading. So let's get into it. Uh, today we are going to show you about the program development cycle and we are going to go through this entire cycle with you um, as we start to develop an example project and then you can move into your um, actual project. So we'll go through the development of the problem, we'll talk about it, make sure we understand it, and then we'll go through the planning phases of everything and how to implement that plan through pseudocode and flowchart and then how to actually code it up in Python. So let's get into it. Let's talk about the program development cycle. So the cycles, it, it just works its way from the top all the way around in the clockwise fashion. Um, what we need to do first and foremost is always understand the problem to be had. So in this particular class, I'm going to offer you the problem if for whatever reason you don't understand some of it. You need to make sure that you ask because you cannot code a solution to a problem you do not fully understand. If you don't have all of the information going into it, if you don't have an understanding of how you're going to attack it, there's no way for you to code it. For instance, I'm not a very good chess player. I don't know all of the rules of chess. Um, so me coding a game of chess is just never going to work. I can code, I can code all sorts of other games, but I'll never be able to do chess correctly just simply because I don't know how to play it correctly. So if I wanted to do that, I'd first have to learn how to play it appropriately, then I can go back and actually write a program for it, although be it a very difficult program to write, I could do it once I had a full understanding of it. So that is without a doubt the most critical task of any program is to understand the problem first and foremost. Only once you fully understand can you begin to pseudocode, write code, correct your syntax errors, test it, and debug it. Right? So once it's understood, you can start designing the actual program. Basically, we're going to use two different tools. We're going to use flowcharts and pseudocode. Uh, pseudocode is more like an English-like representation of code, so you don't necessarily need to know Python or Java or anything else to write pseudocode. Um, it can be helpful to have an understanding of a language prior to um, writing any pseudocode, just simply because then you can start using some of the vocabulary from the program language in your pseudocode. It is not meant to be code, though. Okay? It is not supposed to be something executable. It's meant to get your thoughts down on paper and just blast out the logic of the problem rather than focusing on syntax. Uh, a flowchart is very much the same thing, uh, except it's a pictorial representation of your logic. So we will use symbols and lines cascading from one symbol to the next to connect the logic, to see the relationship, to see the looping activities and the decision activities, um, to see where the modules are coming into play. It, it's a far more visual uh, way of expressing your logic. And we're going to do both in this course. You're going to do both in this lesson. So uh, let's keep that in mind. Jumping into pseudocode here. Uh, pseudocode for a number doubling problem. It's a very simple problem just to kind of get you with the, the gist of what I'm looking for in pseudocode. Pseudocode basically sets up where you've got a start and a stop or maybe a module name and a return statement, but for now we're going to go with start, stop. And then I do a series of indentation here to kind of show that I'm within the program. I'm inside the start and stop. You'll use keywords like input, set, and output to kind of designate what's happening throughout the program. And then you'll use your own vocabulary here like my number, my answer, so on and so forth to represent the parts of the problem um, that you kind of own, the variables of the problem. So you could use the words begin and end. You might write instead of set my answer, you might write something like get my number or calculate my answer. The words used 
aren't super important as long as they convey the right message. So the verbs that you use, they're going to get translated into whatever programming language you want. So they're not super important just as long as they convey the right message. And then we can translate it to the program language we want. You should be writing pseudocode so that it can work with any programming language we need. Um, after that, it's just a matter of programming it. So um, don't be specific on the focus on the words here, like input, set, and output, although those are good words. Um, just anything will work as long as it conveys the right message. So here's an example of a number doubling problem. We would want to input my number, my number being the variable that I'm going to store. I'm going to set my answer equal to my number times two. So I'm going to double the number, set it to my answer, and then I'm going to output the answer. So it's a pretty simple bit of logic. When it comes to flowcharts, you can do the same logic, but you got to know the symbols that go into it. In uh, flowchart, we have a few basic symbols. We'll have this oval symbol for our terminal symbols. Those will be like our start and stop. Um, we've got a parallelogram for input, a rectangle for processing, another parallelogram for output, and a diamond for a decision symbol. You'll notice that the input and output symbols are identical. It's oftentimes we come back through this I.O. device, input, output, anything. Um, they're going to use the same symbols in flowchart because we kind of refer to them as being the same sort of uh, mechanic or, or um, a piece of hardware that we're working with. Okay, So here's the pseudocode for the number doubling problem directly next to the flowchart for the number doubling problem. So we've got the pseudocode here and it follows with the flowchart here. So we're going to start, terminal symbol, input goes in a um, parallelogram, a process, set my answer equal to my number times two in a rectangle. Again, output going in a parallelogram, followed up with our terminal symbol, and everything flows from one piece to the next so we can see the logical progression of our problem. Okay. Uh, when you're breaking down your problems, you're going to break them down into basically three forms, and your program should see these three pieces in every program that you do uh, pretty distinctly. Um, we'll call it an IPO diagram to help mock up our programs that we're going to make. An IPO diagram simply stands for input, processing, and output. Okay? You're going to input whatever data that's going to be used in the program or going to be transformed through the program. The process is going to do something with that data that you input. And output is simply going to be your prints or maybe it's going to return it to a file or show it on the screen as a graphic or give us a sound or something. Uh, it's going to output something for us to work with. So there's lots of different ways that we can work with inputs and outputs, but the process is always going to be based on some series of logic that we're going to have to figure out. Okay? So this is what we would call an IPO diagram where we can see the input, the process, and the output. Once you're working with input and processing something, you've got to know how to store that information so that when you put it in the computer, you don't lose it, so that you can process it and that you can output something. Um, generally, we're going to use variables for this. Variables are just a namespace in memory, so that RAM that we talked about in Module 1, we will store information upon that. Um, the store's location is a hexadecimal value that we would have to register, but we don't like to do that. We actually like to name our variables, so we'll name them like something like um, uh, square foot, square footage, or total, or num students, or whatever it may be and that will represent a location in memory. Um, generally, we're going to have to classify them by the data type that we want to use. Python actually doesn't do this, but other languages do, like C++ or C, um, Java. You have to make sure that you declare what type of information is going to go in a variable because they're very specific about memory usage and consumption. So your data types that we're going to work with are going to be basically integers, uh, floats, which are decimal values, strings, which would be a collection of characters or words, uh, a single character, Boolean objects, which simply mean true or false, and then full-blown objects or maybe lists or arrays or, or different uh, data structures that you can work with. So all of those can be stored in sort of this namespace of memory, which we can know as a, a variable. Um, Data types will also tell you what you can do with that type of information. So, for instance, an integer, you can add to another integer. 
a string you can concatenate with other strings. Booleans you can test against a logical condition. So based upon the type of information it is, it kind of dictates what you can do with it. Python uh, versus Java, let's just say we take those two languages because they work with variables very differently. Python is what we call a dynamically typed language, which means the data type of the variable isn't set until you actually give it value. And the variable itself can change data type throughout the execution of the program. Whereas in Java, it's what we would call a statically typed language, where you first must tell us exactly what type of information to expect, and then make sure you give us that exact type of information. And throughout the duration of the program's execution, the type of information that's in that variable can never change. That's not to say the value can't change. You can take an integer and change it from a variable that holds an integer from a 2 to a 3, but you can't change it from a 2 to the letter A. That just would not make any sense because it just changes the entire complexity of the variable. And therefore, we wouldn't know what to be able to do with it anymore. Another difference between, say, a compiled language and interpreted language, whereas a compiled language we have to know up front, whereas interpreted, we know it line by line, so if it changes and it's useful to us at that point in time, it's fine. We can actually work with it that way. When it comes to processing, once you've got your input down, processing comes down to three basic programming structures. You can just do simple sequence, where you do programming instruction after instruction after instruction. You can use a selection structure where you ask a yes no question here and based upon the answer you do something. Uh, or if the answer is yes you do something, if the answer is no maybe you don't do anything at all. Or you do something entirely different being the difference of a one way selection versus a two way selection structure here. You also have iteration or a repetitional example where you might ask a yes no question if the answer is yes you do something or some things and then you return back to the question to ask it again and hopefully at some point in time throughout this processing the answer to this question will end up being no and you'll exit what we call this looping structure otherwise you get stuck in what we know as an infinite loop. When it comes to processing, um, the most basic form of processing is going to happen with your basic arithmetic operators. Um, in every programming language, you have a set of arithmetic operators. Uh, in Java, it's pretty basic, very similar to what we used in all of our math classes throughout high school and most of college and grade school. You've got addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. The only one that you probably haven't used since the third grade if you've never done any programming is this modulus operator. It's actually the same thing as division, but instead of giving you a decimal value, it will give you a remainder instead. So if you remember back to like the third grade doing long division, where you would take a number and divide it out, you'd end up with some parts left over. The modulus answer is what those parts are left over. And it's the same thing in Python. We still have addition, subtraction, multiplication. Then we end up with these different styles of division. And this is where things get a little tricky. And I'm about to explain here in a minute. We have what we call real division, <coughs> floor division, modulus, and powers that we can work with. Real division using a single slash will always end up with a decimal answer. When we do floor division, we always end up with an integer answer as long as we're given integers in the problem. And modulus will give us an integer response. That's what makes sense, most sense out of this. Um, real quick, let's just back out and maybe play with this a little bit. And I can show you how it all works. Let me minimize that real quick and go to idle. So if you've already downloaded and installed Python, hopefully you've got a folder here that has the idle program in it. <coughs> what you see when you first open idle, is something called the idle shell. Um, this is a quick interactive mode where you can simply type in things. Uh, this is specific to Python though, so if I type in something like 3 plus 2, I'm going to get the answer I would expect in 5. But if I typed in a 3.0 plus 2.0, I get a slightly different answer in a 5.0. Math in programming, or it's specifically in Python, is very uh, much dictated on the type of information you give it. So if you give it integer answers, you will generally get an integer response. If you give it decimal um, parts, 
to your problem, you will generally get a decimal response. And even if I were to mix them, 2 plus 3.0, I'd still, oops, let me type that again, 2 plus 3.0 without the space, I'll get a decimal response. It's always going to give us the greatest degree of precision that your problem started with initially. Now, the other operations, let's say I did a 3 minus 2, uh, 3, let's try that again, 3 minus 2, I'll get a 1. Uh, let's say I did a 5 times, we use the star key to represent times, 2, I should get 10. And obviously if I did 5.0 times 2, or 3, I get 10.0. So again, if I put in a float, a decimal, I get a decimal response. Now to those division problems. This is where it kind of throws things off a little bit. So if I did something like a 6 divided by 3, two integers, you would think I would get an integer response, just like all the other examples I've given you so far have demonstrated. But in Python, anytime we use the single slash, we actually get a decimal response. So it doesn't matter the problem, 18 divided by 6, I get 3.0. Using that single slash, you're always going to get a decimal answer, which is nice in its own regard. So 7 divided by 2 is going to yield 3.5, just as I would assume. Using the double slash, however, <laughs> if I put in two integers, I still get an integer response. So let's go back to 18 divided by 6. Now I get the answer of 3 instead of a 3.0. <laughs> so it cuts the decimal off and it doesn't allow me to worry about it. Let's say I did something that I know has a fractional part like 5 divided by 2. We know that that should yield a 2.5, but by using the double slash, I actually get a flat two. So I know I'm only telling myself exactly how many full twos are in five, and that says that there are two full twos in five. Same reason if I went with, say, a um, 17 divided by three. It'll tell me that there are five full threes within 17, and no fractional parts. Again, oddly enough, if I were to introduce a decimal into this problem, say 17.0 divided by three, I'd still get a decimal response, but it would not be the decimal you'd assume of 5.6 repeating. It's actually just going to be a 5.0 still because it's a floor division. It rounds down. Okay? And that's essentially what floor means, to take whatever decimal you have and round it down to the nearest integer. So there's a difference between the single slash and the double slash. For instance, 5 divided by 3 and 5 divided by 3. So you've got to be aware of what those will do for you. Now, if you want to do exponents, it's pretty simple. 2 raised to the third power. You use a double star notation, and it will give you an 8. Again, if you introduce a decimal into this, 2.0 to the third power, you will get a decimal response. So the arithmetic in here is fairly simple. Um, if you put decimals in, you will always get a decimal out. The only time you will always get a decimal out with integers is if you do this simple um, slash, the single slash. Now the one operation we haven't talked about yet, which seems to be always the most confusing, is the modulus operator. The modulus operator is used with a percent sign. Really what it gives you is the remainder to a problem. So for instance, if I went back to this 5 divided by 3 example, I know that I can get one full 3 out of 5 with a fractional part left over. But what is that fractional part to me? Well, let's see, 5 mod 3 gives me an integer 2. I can get one full 3 out of 5, but there's always those two units left over, and that's what that division will give me, the remainder. Very helpful if I want to figure out if a number is, say, even or odd, 19 mod 2. Any time you divide something by 2 and check its remainder, if the remainder is a 1, you know it's odd. If the remainder is even, you know it's or if the remainder is zero, I should say, you know it's even. So this will always give you the fractional part that's left over as an integer, um, unless of course you introduce a decimal into the value, and it will still work, oddly enough, but it still will. So this is a very helpful operation when you're dealing with cyclical action, something to happen like every fifth term, every third term, something like that, and it'll start to make a little bit more sense with our uh, selection and repetition structures. But just keep that in mind that you have basically six different operations you can work with. You have addition, okay? you've got subtraction, you've got multiplication, you've got division, which is real division, you've got floor division, 
which is two slashes, and you've got the modulus operator that you can work with. So you've got essentially six very useful operations to work with, not counting the double star being the power notation and the equal sign being the assignment operator. So those are slightly less common except for the assignment operator. But real real Realistically, you will use all six of these very, very frequently within this class. Um, you will use this modulus operator very much, so it's worth getting used to how it operates. Okay? So, uh, when we're dealing with uh, programming languages, we still follow this PEMDAS kind of um, order of operations here. We always deal in parentheses and grouping symbols first, then deal with our exponents. Multiplication division, even though we have lots of different division, they still happen all at the same time. So your real floor and modulus operators will happen from left to right at the same time. And then your addition and subtractions will kind of take over from there. Right? So now that we've done input and out or processing, time to talk about some output. Output can really mean a couple of different things. Usually in this class, it's going to be about text back to the screen, something that our program is giving back to us. But realistically, it could be lots of things. It could be video on the monitor. It could be a vibration in a controller, uh, music playing through a sound bar, anything that would allow me to record or see that my information that I put into it has been transformed in some way, shape, or form. Now, if you're interested in how a print function works in Python, you feel free to click here and it'll bring you to what's new in Python 3 and how the print function works. Um, you can read through this. It is quite the page here, but these Python docs are extremely helpful in any way that you want to work with, so feel free to get used to using them. Uh, but as far as how they'll work, let's go through a couple examples really quick. Uh, what we can do in here. So if I open my programs real quick, module two examples. I'm going to first look at this uh, game over program, and I'm going to open this up in idle. Um, <clears throat> so this gives you some different ways of working with the print statement. The print statement is pretty simple. You type out the word print here, and then you encapsulate everything within a set of parentheses because print's a function and all functions end in parentheses and then you have to provide it with some sort of argument so this one is going to say program game over 2.0 close quotes so you'll notice here I've got a double set of quotes at the beginning and end and actually a single set of quotes in the middle and that's perfectly legal because you have to open and close whatever your string is the collection of characters with the same style of quote and any quote that show up in the middle as long as they're the opposite style will actually display Okay. And we'll go through a couple other print statements as we go. Uh, you can separate things with commas so that you can get different arguments in there or maybe uh, different variables and their values worth. Um, if a print statement becomes just too long to fit on your window, you can separate it with comma and return and have it on a different line. It'll work just fine. This is an example of an optional argument you can add to the print statement called end. Um, end is a keyword argument. If you set it equal to something, it will say to what to do with the cursor or what to print at the end of your string, whatever it may be. And so here you'll notice when I run this and finally run it, every time I print something, the cursor actually moves down to the next line. Here in this one, you'll notice it actually doesn't. So if I go through and run this really quick, so if I go run run module or just hit F5 on my keyboard and you'll see that it actually prints program game over 2.0 that's from this very first statement here and then I've got the same message as before all separated with commas you'll notice it actually inserts a space where the commas are located here just a bit bigger again still all in the same line and then this is the fun one print here and then on the next print statement says here it is you'll notice all these ended up on different lines every time I ran it because the print statement puts a carriage return after every time it prints. Except for this one. Since I had this end of line character, or this end argument I should say, it changed the end of line character from a return to a single space. And so it says here, and then it kept the cursor on the same line and it's finally prints it is. Now the last one we won't use very often but I think it's fun to illustrate because it's kind of uh, different. Uh, it's what we call a triple, triple quoted string. I can use a series of three quotation marks to begin and end. And what it does is it formats everything that I type to be displayed exactly the way that it's typed. So I don't have to put in multiple print statements or anything like that. Okay. 
So um, just to play with this a little bit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to idle. I'm going to make a new file real quick. Okay. You'll notice that when I make a new file in idle, it doesn't give me these caret symbols anymore because I've gone from the shell, the interactive mode, to what we call a script mode. And so now I can start typing in whatever kind of things I want. Here, if I use the hashtag key, it's going to symbolize that it's a comment. What that means is it's something I can type as a description, but the interpreter, the program, when it executes, it's never read by the computer. So it's just me uh, typing it in so that I can see it. Whoever else wants to read the code can actually see it. So I might say here that this is a print example. And here, I just want to show you that if I go print and end it with some quotes, and then I can say print whatever I want, I can go hello world, because that's always the first thing you'll ever type out. And then I can go through it. And now I need to save this before I run it. So let me close some of this other stuff. Uh, I would like to kill it, yes. And if I hit F5, it'll prompt me to save it automatically. Um, and I'll say OK to save. And it should bring up my documents. And I'm going to say that this is my print example. Yeah. And we'll put that in the right place. Oops. And we'll save. And now it should run, and it'll say print hello world. World. Now, one thing you got to be careful of is if you misspell the word print, it's not going to work. It's not going to like that one bit. If I attempt to run this, it's going to say that print is not defined because you have to type it exactly the right way. If you use the wrong set of quotation marks, let's say you open with a double quote and close with a single quote, again, it's not going to like it. Okay? Error while scanning literal. So it shows the error message right here. That's fine, okay? If I want to put a different set of quotes in there, say print, hello, fab, -ulus, if that's even spelled right, world. This should work, no problem, right? But if I were to change the style of quotes and attempt to print double quotes inside, just like we did with some of those other programs, it's not going to like this. I mean, notice it's black right off the bat. That just tells you something's wrong because I have a set of quotes here opened and closed and then opened and closed again with nothing else. If I wanted the double quotes instead of the single, I would need to encapsulate this with single quotes. So Python does not differentiate between singles and doubles as long as you open and close consistently. All right? So something to be very, very aware of. Okay? So that basically does it for the print statement. We'll get through more complex examples as we go and start to introduce variables, and you'll see that throughout the um, examples that we do throughout the rest of this. Okay. So let's wrap this up with an example. Um, I'm going to go through and show you how to do this, and that way you can kind of mimic it for your lab. First thing we're going to do is we're going to try to understand the problem. The problem is to write the logic and create a program that will convert a number of inches into an equivalent number of yards, feet, and inches. So for instance, if I were to type in that um, I have 42 inches, I want to know exactly how many yards, how many feet, how many inches that full 42 inches is. So for me, I'm going to want to first know how many inches there are in a yard and in a foot. Well, I know there are 36 inches in a yard, 12 inches in a foot. So if I've got 42 total inches, that means I've got one 36 inch yard, okay, with what, six inches left over? Not enough for a full foot. So when this program is finished, it should print out that I have one yard and zero feet and six inches worth of length here for a total of 42 inches. So you need to make sure that your program can enter a number of starting inches, should calculate the number of yards, feet, and inches that when combined are equivalent to the starting inches, and it should display everything we want to display. So I'm going to show you how to do pseudocode, then flowchart, and then actually write the code. So let's start with some pseudocode. Pseudocode always begins with a start and ends with a stop. Let's bring that up here. Okay. In between, we need to identify all the information we're going to use throughout this program. So I might make some what we would call declarations. Okay. 
in those declarations, we have to tell us, okay, what is the information we need to hold on to and use the process? So for me, I'm going to have a number of starting, I'll call it starting inches. And the reason I'm capitalizing starting inches is because I want this to be a constant. I never want the starting inches to change throughout the program so that I can actually um, keep it there when I print it. I can always make the two values of yards, feet, and inches and the starting inches show that they are actually equivalent. I'm also going to have a number for the number of yards that I'm going to be using, a number for the number of feet that I'll need, and a number for the number of remaining inches. Now notice how I'm not putting any spaces in the variables that have more than one word. I use a method called camel casing where my variables always start with a lowercase letter unless of course they're going to be a named constant. And then I do not include a space in my variable names because programming languages won't allow you to put a space in your variable names. So to make it look like more than one word, I capitalize every subsequent word. So like inches, I capitalize the I. All right. Now, moving into the actual input part. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to input starting inches. Okay. And once I have that, I can begin the processing that I want to do. So I want to set or calculate or get yards. And this is where I'm actually going to show the math and how I'm going to do it. And I'm going to relate it to Python as best I can. I'm going to say set yards equal to starting inches divided by 36. And the reason I'm dividing by 36 is because I know there are 36 total inches in a yard. And I'm using the double slash because I know I want yards to be an integer value. I don't want a decimal in any way. Even if it is a .0, it's still just not going to look right when I get it all said and done. I want a full number of yards to represent this because the remaining parts are going to be held within those feet and inches. So once the yards are set, I'm going to say, okay, let's set remaining inches. equal to the starting inches mod 36. Well, if you think about it for a sec, what is that going to do for me? Precisely what it's going to do is it's going to tell me exactly how many inches are left over after I've already pulled out all 36 inches from the yards. I don't care about the starting inches anymore because I don't want that calculated into the number of feet because I already have all that um, all of those quantities or those inches pulled out into this number of yards so if I pulled out one yard from whatever it is that's 36 inches I don't need those 36 inches in what's left over to help me calculate feet I also don't need anything greater than 36 and this will effectively give me that Okay, so once I've got that, I can set oops, feet equal to now remaining inches divided by 12. And we're going to do that for the exact same reason we did the yards, except we know there are 12 inches in a foot. And then I'm going to simply set remaining inches equal to the remaining inches mod 12. And that'll tell me how many inches are left over after I've already taken out yards and feet. Okay, so here are basically my two first two parts to any program. First part being input, second part being processing, now the third part being output. So I'm simply going to output or print my yards, or I should output my starting inches, Output yards, output feet, and output remaining inches. And then my program is complete. Okay. So that's what it looks like in pseudocode. Let's see if we can figure out how to write that up into a flowchart as well. Okay, so we are going to 
draw our flowcharts in draw.io. So just go to any web browser you want, it's hopefully Google Chrome, and go to draw.io and hit enter and you'll see um, basically this screen here where you can put it in your drive, your OneDrive, your device. I'm just going to throw it on my device for the time being. You can throw it wherever you'd like. I'm going to create a new diagram. We'll call it, uh, what is it, uh, inch converter. Inch converter. Okay, and it's just a blank diagram. Over here on the left is your tools. I'm going to collapse the general tools and open up the flowchart tools. And so basically we're going to make a flowchart for the pseudocode that we have over here. So here I am going to start with my terminal symbol. And once it's highlighted, I can simply say start. Okay, And then these handles allow me to resize it however it is I wish. I'm going to use a rectangle for processing my declarations. So I'm going to open that up just a little bit wider so I've got something to go with. I'm going to go declarations. And I'm going to go num, what do we call it, starting inches, right? And then num yards, num feet, and num remaining inches. Okay. Now, to connect one part of the diagram to another with a flow line, it's pretty simple. You can get connectors like arrows and stuff but it's easiest just to look for these little handles and might be hard to see on the screen, but as you go over, you'll see little X's all around it and they'll highlight green. So just simply click and drag to another one of those X's and that will glue it to the, um, from one piece to the next. If you ever want to duplicate a piece, you can just hit this down arrow and it will duplicate it for you. I don't particularly want to do that right now, so I'm going to cut that out. Now I need some input. Okay, so I'm going to line that up, and those little lines there will help you kind of center things up. I'm going to say input starting inches. And for some reason in draw.io, it doesn't like to put the um, words inside the diagram for the parallelogram, so I'll have to select it, come over here to the right, text, and instead of position being bottom, I want position center. Okay, and again, I will connect these with some flow lines. Okay, and then we've got some processing. Now you've got some options on how you want to do this. I don't want to put all of that processing in one processing symbol, but I don't mind grouping similar items. So I might do this kind of in like two steps or something like that. So I might say something like set, sorry, set yards equal to starting inches divided by 36. And then the second part of the process I might say set uh, remaining inches equal to starting inches uh, mod 36. I just kind of feel like those are two processes that kind of go hand in hand, so you might as well put them together. I'm not going to include the feet because it's a different calculation of dividing by certain a different amount. Again, there's no one right way to do this. Um, but this is my interpretation of it. So I'm going to drag in one other processing symbol. I'll see if I can make it about the same size as the other one. So you'll get used to it as you start going. I'm going to say set uh, feet equal to remaining inches. Inches uh, divided by 12. And I'm going to say set remaining equal to remaining inches uh, mod 12. <clears throat> and again, flow lines. Okay. And then we'll finish this up with some output. Now, again, um, I don't always do this and want to put all the output in one particular piece, but since all this output kind of relates to one another, not one thing is kind of any more significant than the other, I'm just simply going to do this and make things a little bit easier on myself. I'm going to say output starting inches, output yards, output feet, output inches, or I should say remaining inches. And 
again, still kind of screwy with that, so I'm going to go from bottom to center. And then connect with the flow line. And my last terminal symbol is going to be here. Stop. And there we go. Okay. Fun. Connect. And here we are. Connection. I can move things over so it looks a little nicer. A little cleaned up. And there we go. So I can move these kind of around up and down however I want. Now, if it's in your drive, you can easily add this to any Google document you want. Um, as far as submission of your pseudocode goes, um, really what you want to do when you're submitting something, go File, and you want to export as, and you can export it as a PDF. Right? We can try that, and we will just, um, we can select what we want to export. Okay, all of these things if we want. If there's a lot on the page, right? And I can go selection only if I like, and I can hit export, and I can export it directly to my device, and that way it'll download it for me. And if I look at it as a PDF, now this is what I'm looking at, and you can turn that into me. Okay, so there's your um, version of the flowchart. Okay, that would go with the accompanied pseudocode. Okay, as far as submitting the pseudocode feel free to just do a file save as, and you can just upload uh, the regular TXT file, the text file, okay? So you can say save as inch converter .txt, save it, and then you can upload just that TXT file, okay? So there's your flowchart, there's your pseudocode, Okay, right. now it's time to actually code this in Python and see how similar that all is. So let's come back over here. And let me minimize that real quick, get it out of the way. And so let me close everything up and just like we're starting from scratch, like we haven't done anything yet. So applications, I'm gonna find Python. All right, I'm gonna open idle. Okay. And let's open up that shell. Oh, we don't need the shell, but what I really need is a new file. So I'm going to go File, New File. Okay. And so I've got this. I'm going to see if I can't. Uh, let's see here. Where's my preferences? I'm going to set the font size a little larger so maybe we can see it a little better. Oh, no, that's starting spaces. I want four. Uh, size. Let's go with 18. Okay. Now you should be able to see it a little better. Okay, so uh, first thing I'm going to start off with the comment and have like an author. And a date. Let's say today is, oops, 9-1-2019, right? And a description. This is going to convert inches to yards, feet, and inches. Okay. Every project you do should have some sort of uh, title at the top, or at least uh, something on the lines of the top that's something like this, with the author name, the date in which you do it, or have last done it, and a description of the activity. It just makes it a little bit easier to understand what's going on with it. So, back to our pseudocode, okay, or our flowchart, either or. Let's see what we want to do here. Um, so the declarations in Python, I don't really make declarations in Python. Um, the variables will come as we need them and you tell it what data type they're going to be upon instantiation. So really, even though it's nice having it in pseudocode and some languages require this declaration phase, specifically like C++ and Java for the most part, um, we're really going to start here with our Python file. So starting inches. Okay. So First thing we want to know about getting input from the user, okay, there's a pretty basic function for that. We're going to come up with a variable name, starting inches, okay, and if we want to get user input, what we do is we gather it from an input function. Just like the print function, notice how it turns blue, it's just a built-in Python function that allows us to get input from the user. And what you type into this function is the question you would like to see displayed on the screen when you um, want to gather that information. So here I might say something like, enter a number of starting inches, parentheses, colon, stop. 
Now, at that point in time, when I do this part of the program, it'll simply say this at the very top of my command line, and then I'll have to be able to enter something in, and it will turn it into inches. Okay. Now, let's just test that out and see what happens. So, real quick, if I say print starting inches, okay, I'm going to hit File, Save. Okay. Yeah, we'll get this nice CIS. Oops, wrong folder. Desktop. Where are we at? Users. Desktop. Lock two. Okay. And we're gonna save this as um, prelab. Example. So what you'll see is it'll say, enter a number of starting inches. Let me open that up. And if I type 36, it prints 36. Nothing happens, okay? Not a big deal, okay? But what you should know is that this is not actually a number. It's actually a string, okay? And what happens is when I use that number, starting inches, I can't add it, I can't divide it, and I can't do anything with it. So for instance, say I did x equals input enter a number okay enter a number two right all right now let's say i did y equals input enter a number enter three okay well, let's just simply take x plus y and the normal person would say, well, that's easy, that's the answer 5. But Python, not being normal, would say it's 23. Because the input function doesn't actually allow you to gather numbers, it allows you to gather information from the keyboard, which on the keyboard, it's all just characters, or in our sense, a string. And when I add strings together, it goes through this process called concatenation. It takes the two that I entered for x and the three I entered for y, and adds them together to give me 23, because characters don't have value. So the only way it knows how to put them together through addition is to slam them together. So if I took like the character a and added to it the character b, right, that's fine, I get a, b. If I take the character 20, or sorry, five, and add to it the character seven, I'm going to get 57, but we all know 5 plus 7 as integers actually yields 12. So how do I get back to this and turn it into an integer? Well, since this gives me a string, what I need to do is take this value and convert it to an integer. That's actually pretty easy. I can actually wrap this input function in another function called int. There are two such functions, int and float. I know the value I'm going to be putting in is an integer, a non-decimal value. So I can convert it to an integer pretty easily. So let's say I did this, x equals int input enter a number. I close everything and I say it's 5. And I say y equals int input enter a number, and I say 7. Now when I take x plus y, I get actually the 12 that I'm expecting because it changes it to an integer as I'm working with. There's another function called float, let's say a equals float input, enter a number. When I do that and I say like a 12.3, now it actually stores it as a 12.3 that I can work with and I can go A plus two and I'm gonna get 14.3 the way that I'm expecting. It's not treating it as a string anymore. So you really have these two conversion um, characters here, int and float, that allow you to do it. So now starting inches is no longer any string information, it's actually integer information that I can work with and to perform the rest of my processes with. So the processes we have left are pretty simple. Yards, feet, remaining inches are what we need to set. Since these aren't declared as anything and I'm going to take an integer value and divide it by another integer, this should become an integer value. So let's just work on doing it. 
So as far as my processing goes, I'm going to go yards equals my starting inches. Starting inches divided by 36. Okay. And remaining inches equals mod 36. And I can do the other processing too. Feet equals remaining divided by 12 and remaining inches mod 12. Okay. Last thing I need to do is my output. So here's my input, here's my processing, okay, here's my output. So print, okay, and I'd like to be able to display the number of starting inches. So here I'm going to go through that process or use some of those print statements that I learned before. So I'm going to say starting inches. I'm going to go comma, and I'm going to write starting inches. And what that's going to do is print this string followed up with this particular character. I'm going to make this a little easier to read by a colon and a space. And I'll do the same thing with the other ones. Print, make sure you spell it right. Uh, yards, colon, space it out a little bit. Yards, print, feet, colon, space it out a little bit so it looks neat. Feet. I'm going to go print inches. Oops, excuse me, wrong button. Space, space, space. Oops, remaining inches. So now if I run this, save it, run it. It's going to ask me for a number of starting inches. Let's go back to that example of 42 before where we know we have one yard and six inches. So 42, and I should see that starting inches is 42, one full yard, six inches, zero feet. If I were to run this again, so hit F5 again or run the module, let's say I entered 193 inches. Well, that should tell me it's five full yards, one feet, and 13 inches. That seems a little odd. Oh because I didn't actually use a uh, assignment statement here. So let's go back to that process. So here, design, write the code, correct syntax errors, didn't have any. We tested, now it's time to debug. I made a mistake here by just taking the math and doing it without actually assigning anything. So I really need to say remaining inches here is equal to the remaining inches divided by 12. So let's try that one more time with, I believe the number was 193. And now everything seems to work appropriately. Okay, five full yards, one foot, one inch all together. So um, that's basically it. Um, there is one little shortcut that I can make to a lot of these. Um, and I'll kind of show you what that is here um, on some of these. We call them augmented assignment operators. So we could do the assignment like this, where I say remaining inches equals remaining inches mod 12, or remaining inches equals starting inches times 12. It's this line of code that seems that we can actually shorten up, and that's what I thought I did initially. So I can actually write this line of code a little bit differently. So if I know I'm going to be working upon one variable and only manipulating the value of that one variable, I can actually do it like this. I can go remaining, let's see if you can see that, inches. And instead of saying equals remaining inches mod 12, I can put in a special set of characters where it says mod equals. And I can just put 12 here. And what that says is basically a shorthand notation for this. Remaining equals equals remaining inches mod 12. I could say remaining inches mod equals 12. So it'll take this value, divide it by 12, get its remainder, and assign it back in. You can do that with every operation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, floor division, real division, modulus. Um, 
if you are only going to be working upon one variable, you're manipulating the value of one variable by some other value, like a 12, or maybe it is even a variable, but you're just manipulating it. It's much shorter to write it like this, and it still works appropriately. 193. I still get the exact same output as I would expect, but it's a nice, easy way to kind of um, work with stuff. So anytime you have a variable, okay, let's just get some room here. Let's say I had um, value equals four. I can always increase value by one by just doing value plus equals one. If I print it, it's five. Okay, I can go value minus equals uh, three. And now it's two because it was five. I deducted by three. I can go value times equals two, print value. It's four. And I can do it with all the other operations as well division, um, floor division, real division, and as you've seen, modulus. So. There you go. That's kind of the idea here between what you need to do for this next lab. This next lab is just basically there to get you used to using the um, arithmetic operators that Python has to deal with and some simple processing in your programs just using basic arithmetic. The lab you're going to be doing just so that you can be sure that you understand the problem. Let's take a quick peek. Um, you're going to be doing some basic computations, okay? And this is going to change just a little bit in terms of points from what I had before, but what you're going to be doing here is you are going to be working with change. So you're going to enter a number of pennies, much like I entered a number of inches, and you're going to convert that to quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So if I typed in 143 pennies, you should know that the exact same value of 143 pennies is equal to the same value of five quarters, one dime, one nickel, and three pennies put together. Okay? If I took 2013 pennies and put it together, that's 80 quarters, one dime, zero nickels, three pennies. And that's the first part to your lab that you're going to have to work with. So you're going to design the logic for that piece and code it for me. The second piece you're going to do is you're going to design the logic and code for me basically the exact same thing, but instead of entering in a certain number of pennies, I'm going to enter in four different values for quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies, and it's simply going to total it for me. So if I typed in five quarters, six dimes, three nickels, two pennies, it's going to tell me that the total amount was two dollars and two cents. If I typed in 13 quarters, one dime, five nickels, three pennies, my total amount is $3.63. So two problems that you are going to need to develop the logic for and program, one of which will develop some pseudocode, the other you will develop a flowchart for. Um, check the lab document to see what you're going for which and how many points everything is worth. Um, it's a 40 point assignment, so it's not something you'll want to miss early on, but that is basically the gist of it. You're going to be doing the same exact basic thing that we did here with um, different amounts, quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. So hopefully that all kind of makes sense as you go through it. Again, I'll have a discussion board open up in module two to ask any questions you may need to ask, and that way we can get the answers out to everybody for that particular question, so feel free to use that. And if you have any um, questions for me personally, please reach out via email and I'd be happy to help you out with anything you may need. Um, thank you and hopefully you enjoyed module two.